So, um, so we're going to be talking about um, risk management and uh, internal control, um, which uh, you know it is it's a very important topic. Uh, but uh, as with many things in corporate governance, um, we don't we, we we tend to get the material from. Uh, the primary sources, and obviously some secondary sources, but the textbooks um, generally don't deal with it. So if you, I mean, there are two ways to look at it. Take uh, a total company law textbook, Gower and company law. All right. So Gower and company law will be looking at the constitutive rules, uh, and, and therefore the analysis will be on the duty of care, right? Uh, enshrined in section 174. Uh, but as you know by now, that, 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 that doesn't tell us about the ex ante devices you need to put in place to ensure that you have an effective board that is properly able to govern and manage risk. Right? So, the, the, so by definition, the company lawyer's perspective is narrow. And, and that's what we see in GAWA. So it treats it as part of the duty of care. Um, on the other hand, uh, the, the latest book on the subject of corporate governance, uh, the Oxford Handbook of Corporate Law and Governance, um, uh, is published by OUP. Uh, again, it doesn't deal with it. Um, you know, I checked it out, and, uh, and and that was a bit surprising. So, um, what 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 I did was to um, try to weave together. Um, a coherent, hopefully, narrative on the subject, right? So I, I basically take it this way, that assuming I'm writing a book or a textbook or a chapter, whatever the case may be, how will I approach it? Um, and um, that, that's essentially what I do here. Um, so I'll just say a few things about the readings. So for purposes of this class, obviously, um, you know, uh, we're going to go over the 16-page document, which uh, which have been prepared, um, and, and you'll see here that I say the document is divided into five sections. Uh, the first section introduces the, the concepts, so we introduce concepts of risk management, internal control. Internal control uh, used to be an accounting concept. Um, you know the the systems you put in place when running a business to prevent theft, huh? to prevent a fire from burning down your premises or whatever, to prevent your, your, your stock from being lost, and so internal control. But now it's kind of wider. It embraces issues of risk management. So we'll, we'll try to sort out the definitional issues. And then in section B, when we're now clear about the definition of the issues, we then go into uh, the relevant rules. So here we'll be looking at, obviously, had law. Had law will be the duties of directors, which you're conversant with. Uh, the duties of directors, which you're conversant with. And not just the duties, but the, the extenuating circumstances or the, the constraints for the attribution of liability to directors. And by now we know what some of those constraints are. The subjective bona fides rule, the business judgment rule, even delegation, the ability to delegate itself is, uh, is a way out. Um, so we'll, we'll be looking at that, and then we'll look at the soft rules. Now, the soft rules are the code, but you'll notice here that if you focus only on the code, you'll be limited, because the code just contains a few principles. The real detail is in the two FRC guidance documents, right? Uh, so there's a guidance document on board effectiveness, and there's FRC guidance on risk management. Um, and and, and I, I produce the two. I, I give you references to the two documents. By now, you know, if you go back to the first seminar, you just you go to the FRC site, you download those documents. The links have been provided. Okay. And so and what I do, by the way, um, and, and I... I, I I introduce these hard rules and soft rules in a, in a coherent way. In other words, it's not simply a matter of just listing them. 
I try to show where they come in, right? So for instance, if we're talking about, you know, delegation, maybe we're talking about, let's say, uh, 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 delegation to management as, as opposed to delegation to a committee of the board. Uh, so you're doing some kind of vertical delegation. Uh, there, could, there, there is a company law issue as to whether or not you can delegate, right? Uh, there is a company law issue. So I try to weave this in, right, so that we, uh, you know, you understand how these things work. Um, and, and so that's what we do in Section C to provide a roadmap to, uh, uh, to, 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 to apply the relevant rules in managing risk. Uh, and then in Section D, uh, there are a number of case studies. Uh, you would have found fascinating the, the Forex one. Uh, the, you read the Forex, the, 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 the LIBOR one where the guy, you know, the, you, you know the, the transcript from Singapore. Did, did anybody read that? Yeah, so that was quite interesting. And so these are sort of real life situations and the idea basically is to uh, see how to manage risk in a number of uh, settings. Um, and then I thought one way we could sort of test ourselves is to apply this to an emerging problem and that's the problem of cyber security. So, you, you know, so, so if you look at case studies, you see, you know, from the, the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster, right, to uh, Northern Rock, <coughs> right, with its liquidity risk, to, you know, the, the banks who are basically um, manipulating the market. You see risk in a wide range of areas, and the idea basically is to is to think about how to manage these risks. Um, and in terms of the cases, uh, I mentioned here three cases. Uh, the, the first case, Barring's case, you know, if you read this case, if ever you read this case, only read the head notes. And I, I don't think I'll tell you this ever again in respect of any, we always say to people, read the full case. But if I'm telling you to read the head notes, the reason is that the, the case is so long. You know, it's crazily long, right? And a lot of it is just about facts. And, and the head note is super in summarizing, right, the, the, the real principles. So in fact, the head note, the size of the head note would be the length of some other cases, right? So just read the head note, and I'll, I'll, I'll pull it out anyway. And basically, you know, uh, it has to do with Barings Bank, you know, which no longer exists, but there used to be a time when Barings Bank was regarded as the creme de la creme, was regarded as the Queen's Bank, because I find they said the Queen banked with it. And there was a guy called uh, Nick Leeson who uh, was uh, in the Singapore office. There was no real control on his activities um, uh, when Nick Leeson uh, instigated what turned out to be a disastrous foray into the forex market, you know. So he basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, took on some mega losses, no, si no system of controls, and the government brought proceedings to disqualify the directors, right, for not managing him, for not setting up a risk management system. Uh, and you see the court in the context of these disqualification proceedings uh, coming up with a number of pronouncements which are relevant, right? So that's the context, right? So they talk about delegation, they talk about the duty to manage, they talk about the fact that non-executive directors are subject to the same duties as executive directors, right, in, in this regard. Um, and, and a city group is an American case. Uh, again, here the bank collapses, right? Uh, had to be bailed out, make, you know, with lots of money. And the argument here was that the board should have seen the red flags, that there were many red flags. They should have known, and therefore they should have instituted uh, a risk management system to uh, save the bank. And they didn't. So these were proceedings for. Uh, uh, a derivative claim, uh, so a derivative claim was being brought uh, against the directors. And the court basically held that the derivative claim will not be allowed. 
what this case does is show the protection that directors have. It's really difficult to proceed against directors, right? It's really difficult to proceed against directors. Um, and, and, and that raises that raises another issue, um, and, 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 and we see this in the Barovic case, I call this the Microsoft case, where um, Microsoft was basically told by the EU uh, antitrust enforcement authorities to basically make certain changes to its browser type, right, browser choice. Um, and they refused. Not that they, not that they deliberately refused. They just had no system in place to implement those changes, right? And um, a, a fine was imposed on them, right? So we're talking about a fine of over seven hundred million dollars, right? And um, so the question is, should the directors be liable? And th this is an interesting point when dealing with compliance issues. You know, compliance issues basically deal with, you know, violations of, of. Uh, regulatory law, right? So think about, when we think about liability issues, think about two categories of liability for present purposes. Business risk, you're running a business, you get a, you know, you get your strategy wrong, right? And the company suffers a loss, that's just business risk. The general approach of the law is to protect the directors, right? If they get it wrong, right? Because the courts cannot really manage businesses. We're not going to sort of review business decisions of management with, of, you know, with, you know, with, uh, with hindsight. So the general policy of the law is basically the business judgment rule. If you get business decisions wrong, you invest in a market, you set up a plant, and it becomes a complete disaster. Generally speaking, you know, you know, you, you you're not going to be liable. Generally speaking. On the other hand, if we're dealing with a compliance issue, right? If we're dealing with a compliance issue, whether the compliance issue has to do with setting up a system to prevent bribery, uh, or setting up a system to, uh, to, to, to comply with uh, the dictates of some regulatory enforcement authority, like in the Barovic case, then it is impossible for you to say that I should be protected by the business judgment rule because there was no business judgment. You were not exercising any business judgment. You, you get it. You know, uh, so the obligation to stop money laundering, for instance, there's no business judgment there. It's simply an obligation. It's either you do it or you don't do it. And so you can't get protection. Now, if you can't get protection, and the company is liable, obviously, because the regulatory authorities will come down on the company, right? Uh, uh, so if the company is liable, the question then arises, what about the directors? Because what does it mean to say the company is, the company is liable? What it really means to say the company is liable, right, for the fine, is that employees will lose their jobs. That's the bottom line. Or prices will go up, right? So if the company is subject, just check out the, the SEC website in America on fines you know, imposed on companies, you know, so you get a, a company, you know, being hit with a, a $1 billion fine for a compliance violation. Now, if the company gets hit with that kind of money, uh, the people who really suffer are the employees. I, I can understand the, I suppose, the metaphysical purity in the notion that, well, it's a company, the company should be liable. Yes, but who is the company when you lift it? and you look inside, the people who really take the hit are those people. So the question therefore arises, shouldn't we find a way to get directors to pay, right? And, and that, by the way, is what is addressed in the article by Nietzsche uh, on um, corporate illegal conduct. Right? Corporate illegal conduct and, and directors, notice, and directors' liability, not corporate liability, directors' liability. An approach to personal accountability for violations of corporate legal compliance. Uh, corporate legal compliance. So it captures the point I was mentioning.
So um, I'll stop there. Does anybody have any questions so far? Yes. I think that's, that's a good point. Um, there, there is a conflict between the profit maximization role or duty or objective and, uh, and, and, and risk, right? In, 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 in the sense that, you know, you, you know, you've got to crack eggs to make an omelette, right? Uh, so you've got to take a risk. Uh, and in some cases, uh, even if you violate the law, you may make a perfectly rational uh, judgment to, you know, pay whatever damages you need to pay because guess what? The upside uh, is is higher, right? The, 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 you know, the, in a sense, somebody could say there is no duty on a company to always obey the law, right? Uh, you know, you, you know, you can just like in contract law, we talk about the doctrine of efficient breach. There's no duty in contract law to say you can't breach a contract. Sometimes it makes sense to breach a contract, and right because uh, you know uh, th th there is an upside. So I think there, there is that tension. But I think the, the way to resolve the tension is at the point of repu uh, re reputational considerations, because if you think about the uh, if you think about notions of sustainability, if the company is going to be in the market for the long term, then you need to think about the reputation of the company. So whilst that kind of behavior uh, may make sense in the short term, uh, I think you'll be hard pressed to make a case that it would make sense in the long term. But I, I, I do agree that there is that uh, uh, tension. Uh, okay, so, um, so, so essentially, um, you know, financial reporting, which is gonna be dealt with uh, in a future seminar, uh, is linked to this seminar, which deals with uh, risk management, because financial reporting basically reports on the past, whereas risk management is basically looking to uh, prevent risk or manage risk in the future. So one is about the reporting of the past, and, uh, a, 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 and the other is about uh, the, the, the future, and internal control and risk management are, are key aspects of this. But the reason why I make this point about the link is that they often overlap. So if you look at the Enron situation, uh, if, the, if the auditors were not busy doing what they did, uh, you know, uh, if all the systems did not fail uh, and, and, and all the false accounting did not occur, then presumably the company would not have collapsed, right? So there was a clear link in, in the case of Enron. Uh, and, and, and that's the point I, I make here. And likewise with uh, the WorldCom uh, disaster. So problems of the audit process, right, uh, lay at the heart of uh, the collapse of these companies. So there, there is that link. Um, the other point to mention uh, is that for purposes of this discussion, we're not focusing on risk management from a technical perspective. Uh, so, so, I mean, we can talk about it from a technical perspective, but I don't think it will do us much good. I mean, what I mean from a technical perspective is how do you sort of weight risk? Uh, you know, what, what is uncertainty? What is risk, right? Because uh, the, the idea is that uncertainty, you may not be able to weight, you may not be able to capture and measure. But with risk, we can, we can actually uh, assign probability values to the, the, the notion of risk. And, and how do we go about it? You know, 
Uh, so in some cases, in a lot of firms, you have what they call a risk register, right? And you sort of get people to do 360-degree type thinking, horizon planning, to capture every possible risk in the risk register and then assign probability values to those risks occurring, right? Uh, the problem is that, you know, we have all these, you know, cognitive biases, with, we're tied to the past, it's difficult to think about a future risk, right? And when you associate something uh, in a particular way, it's difficult to imagine it differently. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, in the context of uh, the litigation which um, is presently ongoing, uh, uh, where if, if, if JP Morgan deals, as part of its escrow business, deals with companies and states and regularly keeps money in an escrow account. And let's imagine the case of a state, the attorney general of the state and the minister of finance of the state and even perhaps the president all sign off on it, right? Then if that's their usual business, then they're not going to see any risk there, right? Because the, the lawful agents of the state have signed off on it. And in many systems, the attorney general of a state actually has a constitutional role, right? So the attorney general has a constitutional role. And, and, and so when the attorney general says, this is money of the state, we want it to be in an escrow account, and we sign off, and the minister of finance signs off, uh, then what could be wrong with this? So you kind of just imagine, oh, there's no risk. Um, because, in, because normally, you do not see any kind of risk. Nothing goes wrong. But until something goes wrong, right? And when something goes wrong, then I suppose you then see risk. But before something goes wrong, it's difficult to see risk. This is the point I'm making that, you know, because we, we are cognitively trapped into thinking about patterns of the past not new things, right? Uh, and, 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 I, and I suppose this is a, the, the, the notion people like Nassim uh, pointed out when he wrote his book on black swans, right? Uh, that we're, in a sense, that sort of, if you've never seen a black swan before, then in a sense, swanness is defined by whiteness, right? You never see, you, 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 so, so, so that, that is an important point. And so when I think about that, I then say to myself now, because I'm, I'm you know, when I sort of advise on these transactions, I, I kind of wear two hats, uh, obviously the legal side, but also as an academic. And I say, so how could the board deal with this risk? Now, it seems to me that, the, obviously now we know, one way to perhaps do it is to say, any time you have any transaction involving a foreign element, you get foreign counsel advice. I'm sure Telecom tells you this every time. For, all of, for those doing international finance, right? You normally get foreign counsel advice when it comes to your syndicated loans, your project finance, your bond issues. But nobody thinks about foreign legal advice when dealing with the state. You see, because you're dealing with the state. But you only need to think a bit more to say, well, if you're dealing with the state, <laughs> the state has no hands. The state has to act through a government. And the government can get it wrong because everybody is under the law. There's the rule of law. So what if the government gets it wrong? What if this money that the state, it, the government acting on behalf of the state is given to JP Morgan should have to, should come from a constitutional account, you know, maybe what they call a federation account or a consolidated revenue bond. And you've not done it that way, you've done it differently then in that case, you've acted, even the government has acted contrary to law. So it seems to me that in that kind of situation, the, the, the answer surely must be to get foreign legal advice, right? And, and not confine foreign legal advice to your syndicated loan facilities or, right? A very simple solution. But I suppose it's still simple after the fact, right? The challenge would be to to see risk where we've never experienced risk. And I, I think that's really going to be really very difficult. I don't know what you think. Yeah.
definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you know, of course, it's always good to learn from other people's experiences, isn't it? It's always good right, to learn from other people's experiences. But we've got to pity the company that will end up paying over a billion dollars. Right? I'd rather not be in that situation. That, that's the, you know, yes, other people are going to learn, but I think they, what I'm putting forward is how can we imagine risks which have not eventuated? Right? You know, I, I don't know how we can do it, you know, cognitively to imagine things differently. Right? And, and, and if we, so that's why I say, you know, I wonder whether talking about the technical aspects of risk management is useful, uh, you know, you know because I, I, I don't know if I even have the bandwidth mentally to conceive of every possible possibility. I mean, I can come up with the answer to this particular one, right, because the, the problem has already happened, but I'm not really sure uh, this would be the case uh, elsewhere. Um, so, the, the, so the other point uh, to mention um, is that the, the OECD in that document, uh, uh, let me sort of highlight it. So I, I refer to an OEC document. I didn't want to sort of bother you with the, I mean, you can Google it, it's online. Uh, but, but basically what, what, what the document basically says is that uh, the, 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 the weaknesses and failures in corporate governance arrangements um, actually contributed to um, um, excessive risk taking and therefore uh, uh, failures in this area. So I suppose one, 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 one example would be uh, having um, a, a diverse board. So if you say, okay, let's have a diverse board and uh, let, let, more importantly, let's have an independent board, not really diverse. Diverse cannot really be a bad thing. It's, let's, let's prioritize independence in such a way that we, 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 we don't place a lot of emphasis on skills, right? So we're not looking at the skills of the boards, of the directors for that particular industry. We're simply looking at independence. And the OECD report basically says that, well, when you get people who are really independent, but who don't know literally where the bodies are buried, then how can they assess risk, right? And we see this in the AIG type scenario, right? We even see it in Northern Rock. Northern Rock had a state-of-the-art board. All the relevant committees, nomination committee, risk management committee, or the they had everything. But when Northern Rock changed its business model, the business model of, of every bank, but it changed it and went into the financial markets, right, for structured finance to basically get money, uh, then, you know, it was taking a big risk that if those markets did dry up, then there'll be a mismatch. Now, but the problem is, how come the board did not see it? Well, the board was very independent, but maybe not that expert, and therefore they could not see it. Likewise with, I suppose, City, City Group. How come City Group did not see, uh, uh, see, 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 see this? So, um, the so, so I, I, you know, the, 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 that that may be something you might just want to sort of uh, be aware of, and then um, let's now define internal controls. Um, as I said earlier, the notion of internal controls is an accounting concept, but it's now wider. So. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's basically using the accounting sense to ensure that uh, we have systems in place that ensure that financial reporting is not compromised, right? That, that's how accountants basically understand it. Uh, but now it's gone wider than that. It embraces, um, it, it embraces uh, systems you put into a business to ensure that you safeguard the assets of a company, you promote operational efficiency, you know, um, and, and ensure that, of course, that 
your financial statements are also reliable. So to that extent, we see a link between internal controls and financial reporting, which I said we'll be dealing with in the, not, not the next class, but in the class after. Um, and, and therefore, when we talk about this, the, 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 the role of the audit committee is key, right? The role of the audit committee is key um, because the audit committee has to look at these financial documents, but not just that, the audit committee also has to look into your system of, of internal controls. And remember, at the very beginning of the course when we're talking about Iris Chu's paper, where she was saying, you know, let's uh, change the system of corporate governance by, uh, uh, you know, uh, taking the code of corporate governance and putting it into the articles. And I said, okay, fine, if we do that, so let's test it. What if you put in the articles and you starve the audit committee of funds? Right, you start them on funds. Can the audit committee sue? Right, because the audit committee obviously, you know, will not be able to sue, right, because they don't, they, they don't have membership rights. Um, but so the the, the 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 point basically is that um, we we make the audit committee effective, right? We have to make the audit committee effective. And so if you look at some of the questions. Uh, if you read a question and it says, well, it has an audit committee that rarely meets, then that's a no-no, right? The Code on Corporate Governance would talk about meetings of the audit committee. They need to meet regularly. If it tells you, if it tells, if the question tells you that the audit committee had a majority of internal directors, that's a no-no, right? Because the audit committee has to be from people outside to monitor the directors who you fear may cook the books, remember? The reason why you're bringing in the audit committee is to prevent them from cooking the books. And therefore, by definition, they need to be from outside. And then, unlike before, the rules now say that the audit committee must have a member who is financially literate. There's no point having an audit committee of people who can read a balance sheet, right? So, uh, you know, because how can they then deal with internal controls in regard to financial statements? Okay, so and, and, and so that, that really deals with that point here. And uh, then uh, risk management is an aspect of internal control. So we're saying um, internal control here, we use it in a wider sense, not just the, the accounting sense. And we basically say risk management is an aspect of it. Uh, and, and, and what I basically do here is to make a link between, uh, uh, you know, what you started in company law so far, or at least the duties of directors. So we know what the duties of directors are. We know that directors have been given powers to manage the company. Uh, we also know that um, they, there's a duty of care and skill under section 174. We know that there's subjective good faith and the business judgment rule. Uh, and as they manage a company, uh, they would run a number of risks. So there'll be the first risk of strategy risk, right? Do we invest here? Do we do that M&A? Do we expand by means of an M&A or by organic growth? These are strategy issues. You may get it wrong. If you get it wrong, if you have a question and the question shows that there is strategy risk and they got it wrong, Will the directors always be immune from liability? What do you think? Will they always be immune from liability? What, what do you think? So they so so they pursued the interests of the company, uh, but they were clueless. They were they were incompetent. They were, but they loyally pursued the interests of the company. They did their incompetent best loyally. Best effort. Yeah, loyally. Right? Yeah. yeah. So what will happen? There'll be there'll be no liability. Probably. Probably. Okay. Yeah. 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 They they, they should be uh, in breach of in breach of the duty of care. I mean, what you're saying is, I think you're. Let's confine your answer. What you mean is that there'll be no breach of section 172. Right? But it doesn't follow that there'll be no breach of section 174. Right? So uh, the, the only thing, though, is that for us to attribute liability to you under 174, it really has to be clear objectively that you have 
really mismanaged, right? Government no, even before, even before, but very good point, but even before we get to the problem of causation, it has to be clear, right? If, if I'm a judge, I, I'm not going there to review with hindsight a business decision. I'm just going to be saying, this business decision, did it make, <laughs> would any reasonable person do this, right? So, uh, and, and I suppose, uh, so one example could be, you want to do a takeover. And um, so a key aspect would be the price, right? And you do not make any attempt to value the company, right? Now, we know that now there are valuation methods that you can use, some a bit robust, some not too robust, but uh, at the very minimum, you should do a DCF, or what you call a discounted cash flow analysis to fix the value. So imagine uh, they, they, you know, th there's no evidence of that. And imagine perhaps in cross-examination that they were just reckless, right, in, 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 use, in, in fixing a the value, then I suppose that, that would ground liability on, one seven, on the 174, right, because they would not be able to show how they fixed the value. I think that's the point. So, so my, my point basically is that for stra stra strategic risk, you don't have carte blanche, right? There's no total immunity. I, I, I simply say that it's going to be a bit difficult, right, for you to be uh, liable, it's going to be a bit difficult, but uh, you, you, you don't have total immunity. So let, let's just sum it up this way by using your answer first. One, for strategic risk, there will be no liability under Section 172, right? Because nobody would say you're acting in bad faith, right? You're, you're loyally doing your incompetent best. So because you're loyally doing your incompetent best, there will be liability under 174, right? If it's truly incompetent, right? But remember, it's a, it's a high test, right? Because we're not here to review business decisions with hindsight. So you really have to be clear. And then financial risk uh, would be uh, sort of uh, similar. So I suppose the example I gave in terms of uh, buying a company and getting the valuation wrong, that would be a typical example of financial risk. So what I said earlier would apply. Then operational risk, operational risk is the day-to-day -day decisions you take. So think about IT risk. IT risk surely will be operational, isn't it? Right? IT risk. So, so imagine, uh, imagine you, you know, the company, uh, uh, you know, so the company is taking, uh, people's personal data, which is, uh, always happens. Uh, there was this company called, uh, so, you know, I mean, some, some personal data would be fine, some not too fine. So I'm thinking about, there's this company, uh, I'm trying to remember the name now, uh, uh, that was supposed to do an IPO in, in New York, uh, but the, the sensibilities of the New Yorkers was a bit too fragile for this company because the company was trading in the business of adultery. Uh, <laughs> Right? So, so they thought, okay, we'll come to London and we'll do an IPO. In London, we're all, you know, we're, you know in Europe, we're big boys, right? We, can, uh, we don't mind these things. And the idea basically was that, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, the idea was that, you know, they're doing good to society, you know, people who want to cheat. Uh, we can match them together and they do it in cyberspace, whatever. And it, it's fine. And um, the problem was that uh, some people then hacked and exposed everything, right? And of course, lawyers are also happy, right? Because that means, you know, all the divorce lawyers, uh, or, you know, uh, would have a field day. And a few people committed suicide, sadly. I always say, most problems in life go away with time. <laughs> some you just wait, but uh, anyway, so some people committed suicide. So I think that would be an example of real operational risk. Uh, so the question would then be, how should the board deal with this? Now, the board, the board is not expected to engage in day-to-day -day risk management. I do not expect the board to be, taken, to, to be talking about encryption every time. But what the board surely should do, right, is to have a system in place, sorry? Yes. And what supervising means, A, you have a system in place, and B, you make sure at least the system works, right? So just having a system and making sure the system works. And then you can rely on experts to tell you what relevant standards, what kind of encryption 
systems to use, blah, 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 you know, that, that, you know, but it's the failure to have a system that, that would be the problem, right? It, it's the failure to have a system that would be a problem. And in, in a situation like that, where the, co where the company suffers loss, then presumably the, the, the company may suffer proprietary loss. So assuming the company has certain inventions which get taken away, so the company suffers a proprietary loss. But the company also suffers a reputational loss, right? Because the customers, um, you know, uh, uh, who, who, whose data gets taken, especially in this kind of situation. Now, interestingly, when this happened, I predicted that this company would collapse. Nobody would sign up again. In fact, that was advertisement to the company. They got more signings after that. That was just crazy, right? So more people signed up and all that. But anyway, maybe they signed up using different names, I don't know. Uh, uh, and, and, and different credit cards and all that. So, uh, so operational risk is something to think about. Uh, reputational risk, so I, here I divide this. Uh, obviously it's wider, but I, 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 I'm flagging up reputational risk and illegal corporate conduct risk. So you, 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 you know, so think about it. You're trying to take over a company uh, the company has been paying bribes uh, in a different market. As part of your due diligence, you discover that the company has been paying bribes. Uh, then that obviously is a big problem, right? Uh, you, you know, that, that's something you really want to think about. You have to have a system to deal with this. Or even if you're not taking over a company and then you have uh, this. So again, the other case I'm dealing with at the moment so there are these two cases, so one I've talked about, J.P. Morgan, the other one uh, deals with uh, the Italians, <laughs> Sam Gretti, uh, E&I, and, uh, and Shell, right? So, so, so basically, uh, so you have the CEO and, and directors uh, taking, not only paying bribes, also receiving bribes. That's the interesting thing. Because normally, when we read these cases, it's always them paying bribes, you know, what they call facilitation payments. But these guys, too, wanted to make some money, right? And so, you know, so they, they also had secret accounts that money was paid to. So one of the issues that we now have to deal with is uh, the liability of the company. So the, the argument is that the, the company did not have a risk management system in place to prevent these things from happening, right? So because remember now, what we're basically doing is attacking the company for this particular loss. Uh, and there are many ways you could do it. You could do it under the tort of bribery. You could do it for vicarious liability. Uh, and, and whichever way you do it, you're basically saying this company should pay. Right? And, and again, here, the figures we're talking about are about over a billion, right? Over a billion dollars. Uh, and so these are pretty significant. Does anybody have any questions so far on this? Right, so, so, I mean, so what kind of systems would you put in place in, in a situation like that where your director is, and let me say something about the facts, just to, because it's very easy to say risk management, you know, but what kind of system do you put in place? Who guards the guards, remember? So you have a company, in this case, negotiating for an oil prospecting license, right? So the company wants an oil prospecting license. It's called OPL245. And somebody else has this license. Um, you, you, initially, you were granted the license, but the license was taken from you, given to this person. So there's some litigation. And then in the end, you then uh, say, okay, you know what, let's settle this litigation. And the state comes in to say, okay. So the state is a third party. And so Shell, and so we say Shell and you know, the other guys are one. You're gonna get the oil block, the OPL. Uh, but we'll, we'll get this guy to surrender the license. And when they surrender the license, then we'll get Shell and the Italian company to pay over a billion dollars 
to the guy surrendering, the company surrendering the license. And so he, they get the money, and then Shell then gets the license. Now, what kind of system could you put in to stop directorial profit making? I mean, how do we know that the Did you get the point I'm making? These guys are there to negotiate this. We can't say to them, do not negotiate this. And they, they didn't happen to make some money on the side for themselves. They're thinking about their retirement. And you know, retirement's expensive. You know, so if you make $10 million somewhere, that makes life easy. <laughs> so what kind of system can you put in place to do this? In other words, if we're framing this litigation, do we frame it as a risk management issue, as a failure of risk management? Or do you frame it simply as vicarious liability? In other words, you say, we don't know what you guys did. We, we're, not, we're, we're not interested in your risk management systems, right? But all we know is that the wrong conduct of these guys, right, would be attributed to the company. Isn't that an easier way of going about it rather than going down the risk management route? What do, what do you think? Do, 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 you, do you get the point I'm making? Or you don't? Okay. Do. Oh, you do? Okay, no, no, okay. So, okay, me, okay let me put it this way. Um, because I was trying to summarize the facts, but let me, let me so, um, so I'll, I'll go back to the beginning. So, a minister, uh, w when he was in government, awarded himself an oil prospecting license, otherwise known as an oil block, right? It's a license to be rich. <laughs> okay, so he did that. Then a government, a new government came in and said, no, 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 you're fiduciary. How could you award yourself a license? And they took the license away, rightly so, and gave it to Shell huh? and the Italians. And, uh, and, and they then paid $210 million for it. So the, the, the minister who's, or company whose license has been taken is now suing Shell. And in the end, uh, uh, in the end they, they, uh, they reach a settlement whereby he gets, the minister gets the license. In fact, the state comes in to say, we'll give you the license. So now it's the state on their new administration. So they give this, the bad guy the license. But now it's clean, right? Because there was no, he's not in government, right? So he gets the license. But he can't do much with the license, right? He still needs Shell. And so Shell then comes and says, well, we want this license. We're prepared to take the license from you to pay you. But you're a bit too toxic. So um, if we can get a third party, so the state comes in as a third party to say, okay, you know what? We will be in the middle. We will tell the guy to surrender the license to the state. And at the point of surrendering, Shell pays this guy over a billion dollars. And that's what happened. So he surrendered the license. He gets a billion. And then this surrendered license is given to Shell. Right? Now, the guy or the person who brought Shell and the guy together concludes an agent, a, 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 a contract to get a fee. They try to cheat him out of it. He goes to court here. He gets a judgment. Lord Justice Gloucester, Gloucester J gives him $40 million. And that sum is then shared amongst Shell executives and the executives of the Italian company. Right? So we know that that money was shared. So in other words, the directors of Shell, whilst pursuing the interest of Shell, to get an asset for Shell, made some money by the side, right? That's the bottom line. They made some money by the side. And my point is that if we're going to sue Shell, should we say that somehow Shell did not have the right risk management procedures in place in using this guy? But remember, he's a director. He's the guy. You know, how do you do it? Or do you simply say, you know what? Every bad thing that happens is attributed 
to share. We don't really care how it happened. And my point is that I would not go down the route of risk management. It's too fluid. It's not clear to me. I would simply use vicarious liability to say, this guy worked for you. It's like a lorry driver working for a company. You kill somebody in the process of de making your delivery. The company is liable. Simple, it's vicarious liability. Right? I think that's the point I'm making. And, 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 but the larger point I'm making also about risk management is what kind of systems can you even imagine before this happened? You know, it's very easy to say, okay, you know, have a risk management system in place. But what kind of system? Can you think about a system that you can put in place that when a director is negotiating a contract for the company, that somehow the director should not take a bribe? Yeah. Yeah, but, but it's, they're not going to know. It's going to be secret. It's not remuneration. Do you get it? So you have an account in Panama somewhere, and you tell them to wire it to some account or to pay you in bitcoins. You know, who's going to know? Who's going to know? Yeah, yeah, but, but, yeah, but you, you're going to declare that you're taking a bribe? You're going to declare that you're taking a bribe? <laughs> you, I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? You are taking a bribe. You know, you'll serve jail time. Right? You understand that? And it's a bribe. Are you going to declare? You probably won't even confess to your priest. <laughs> you know? And so, so the point is, I, I think the point I'm making is, what kind of risk management system can you put in place? I don't see how you can do this. That's the point, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, so now, so the concept of internal control. So what we've been doing so far is just sort of discussing these concepts yeah, conceptually. So now I say let's embed it in company law. Let's sort of define it within company law. And I say that internal control finds its place in company law in the duty of care and skill 174. Right? And arguably, the duty to promote the success of the company. Right? Because presumably, um, if, you, if you're really careless, right, if you're really uh, very careless about a company, then you're not promoting the success of the company. And technically, it could then be a, a breach of Section 172, right? So in other words, it gets to a point where the breach of 174 becomes so egregious, so bad, that we say, surely, this could not be promoting the success of a company. And then we move you to 172, right? So that way, when we're pleading, we plead a breach of two duties, 172 and 174. You get the point? Okay. So that's the internal control doctrine. That's how I see it in company law, right? 174, 172. But we start with 174, obviously. <coughs> it's only if it gets really egregious, we move to 172. Please bear this in mind, because in, in, sometimes I, I notice questions, like in a problem question, I notice answers where all we just get is just this mismanagement. And then people say, oh, section 172. How? I mean, the guy was just mismanaging. It wasn't like he was doing anything, you know, really bad. You know, he, he, he believed he was doing the right thing. It's 174, not 172, right? It's not that. Do, do you get the point? And even, even after 174, even if you say there was a breach of 174, you need to then show causation, which is the point you made, right? And I'm so happy that we're going to look at these problem questions in the afternoon, right, to test our understanding about uh, of these things so that you're able to kind of relate the breach to causation, right? Because if you don't see causation, then how are you going to sue? Then I say there are three company law questions to address. Can the duty be discharged by vertical or horizontal delegation? Uh, you know, in, in other words, the duty to monitor, right? 
can we say, you know what, let's appoint a management committee or let's appoint a committee on the board. Do you see? There are two different things. Hmm? If you go down, it's management. If it's on your board, hmm? right, then it's horizontal. Now, so from a common law perspective, the, the question would be, is that duty amenable to delegation? That would be the question, right? Because if the articles say the board should do it, then you cannot go down the route of uh, uh, a delegation to management, right? So you need to look at what the articles say. But, but even if you can delegate, the Barings case, which I mentioned, the Barings case tells us that you cannot delegate overall responsibility. You can't delegate and go to sleep and say that's the end. Residual responsibility still lies with you. Do you get it? Then, next question. Is the business judgment rule relevant? That's the second company law question. And remember, I talked about the uh, Citigroup case. And the courts here basically said uh, red flags were alleged. The director's actions are analyzed on the basis of the business judgment rule. So liability will be found only where there is gross negligence, right? Uh, and on considered failure of the board to act uh, in which due attention would arguably have prevented loss. Here, liability will be found only where there is a sustained systematic failure of the board to exercise oversight. So notice, and, so, and, and this was not engaged, the court is saying, what the court is doing here is applying what they call the CAREMAC standard. There was a case decided in America uh, before this called CAREMAC, which dealt with, uh, it was in the health sector. Uh, uh, it had to do with, uh, referrals compliance. And basically, a CAREMAC established two standards. It basically said, for you to be liable for the duty, for a failure to exercise oversight, right? For you to be liable, A, you would have to have failed to set up a system, or B, even if you did set up a system, you would have, have willfully refused to monitor, to, to, to apply the system. Right? It's a very high standard. And, that's, and this meant that most of the cases involving banks after the last financial collapse all failed. There was the, there was the Citigroup case, there was also the Goldman Sachs case, which also failed. Right? So the court stated that the fact that there were signs in the market that reflected worsening conditions is not an invitation to the court to disregard the business judgment rule presumptions. To impose oversight liability on directors for failure to monitor excessive risk would involve courts in conducting uh, hindsight evaluations of decisions at the heart of the business judgment rule. Hmm? Then the other company law question is liability or losses being the risk that we're ultimately concerned with. So losses would be, uh, you know, maybe the company obviously suffers losses as a result of something that has happened, uh, or the company is exposed to a liability, right? So the JP Morgan case, there's gonna be a liability, you know, I say there is, as if the case has been decided. Uh, you know, we've won the first part, by the way, so, uh, uh, yesterday we just got the strikeout uh, thing, so that, that was good. Uh, but the, the, the point I'm making is that uh, corporate liability or corporate losses is ultimately what we're uh, interested in. But that then takes me to the other question, which is who is liable? Who is liable? Uh, so it's not just enough to say, well, the company is liable. Right? We need to go a stage further because the company is liable just means that workers, employees, you know, uh, pay. So. Um, so under what circumstances will there be directorial liability? So if a question, if you have a question and the question says, you know, usually the question could say, a new board, 
has taken over this company, right? A new company has taken over this target. Advise them about the directorial liability. They're, they're not interested in the company's liability. They're saying, can we make the directors pay, right? Um, uh, and, 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 and here I said that if it is a compliance failure type thing, the, ultimately, when you look at the relevant case law, liability tends to stop with the company, right? Unless the relevant regulatory regime, right, tells us that we should pin liability on the directors. So we need to look at the particular liability regime. Right, uh, so um, so essentially, what I'm doing here uh, is make a distinction between business failure and compliance failure. Business failure is when you get, get things wrong. Compliance failure is different. You basically not comply with the law, right? And ultimately, the answer would depend on the regulatory regime for compliance. Right, so think about like modern slavery legislation, right? So the a regulatory regime of modern slavery comes out. If the lawmakers basically say, we want to penalize the directors, then they will construct the regulatory regime to, to, to basically impose liability on the directors, not just the company, on the directors, right? Because that's the goal of parliament. If they've not done that, then they've not done that. This is the point I'm making, right? So if they say that if you have, you know, if you, Maybe you, you need to do certain things with your supply chain to ensure that, you know, there's no slavery and you don't, then the, it's possible for the regulatory regime to be constructed in such a way as to pin liability on the directors, right? So it's difficult to set up an answer without understanding the regulatory terrain. I think that's the point uh, I'm making. So that's why I said uh, this would depend on the regulatory scheme in place. So think about corruption, violation of anti-money uh, anti laundry laws and all that. And I said in most cases of corporate compliance violations, directors often do not face personal liability unless the statutory scheme uh, requires this. And there's no finer place to see this than in the Safeway case. You know the the re Safeway stores in Twigger. There, it was it had to do with an antitrust violation, right? The company was found liable. Then the company brought an action against the directors, right, for indemnification to say you made us liable, we want you to pay. And the directors basically resisted, and the court said, the regulatory regime constructed pins liability on the company and does not want the company to dislodge it elsewhere, right? So the director succeeded. Now, at a policy level, what this means is that it's the workers and employees, the workers that take the hits. That's, do you get the point? You see, so if you read Safeway stores and Twigger, I mean, there are two ways you can read that case. You read it and say, oh, well, so, but, uh, there are three ways you can read it, actually. One way would be to say, oh, we're reading like tort law. You know, you know there's this doctrine called ex topia causa, that if, if you are involved in illegality, you cannot claim, right? So you could read it that way and say, oh, okay, the company, you know, is involved in illegality. The company will not be able to sue on it, right? The ex topia causa doctrine is part of the illegality doctrine. So we could read it that way to say the company was debarred from claiming an indemnity from the directors because the company was acting illegally. Right? That's a very narrow way of reading it, but that's one way. Uh, the other way you could read it would be to say, well, the law does not permit the company from transferring liability elsewhere. The liability by a statutory device should remain with the company. Then the third way of reading it is to say this is all crap because what this really means is that the workers 
suffer because the people who are the guiding mind of the company are immune, right? They are immune, and the only people who really suffer is the company, and who's the company? Who works for you see, there are three ways you could read it. Does anybody have a question? No, I, I, I get I get you completely. I get you completely. How, how can I get directed to you and say unison? And then the company is used to those companies. The company is only being used to because of the action of the director itself. Yeah, and, and, and we see this uh, in, in a case called Restone and Rolls. So in Restone and Rolls, you see that narrative huh, coming through. So that the, the, and, 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 and when we get to the, uh, the Jativa case, uh, you see the court sort of pursuing this and saying, well, but we're not saying, we're not saying that Safeway is wrong. We're not overruling Safeway. It all depends on the facts. So I suppose the, the answer would be this, that if Parliament, in its wisdom or lack thereof, decides to penalize the company, right, then the courts just have to do, uh, just, just have to do that. Uh, this will not be the first time the company will be penalized. Think about all those big fines companies pay, right? You know, for money laundering violations and all that. Who pays it? It's the company, right? Not, 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 the, not the directors. Now, one reason would be, to answer your question, would be that the company has deeper pockets. It's the most efficient person to pay, right? The directors don't really have money. Yeah, I, I, get your, I get your point. I think your point basically is this. They should be seen as complementary. Yes, I mean, because if the director is, is you know, found to be innocent, or, 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 you know, the court decides that he did nothing wrong, I, I, the company did something wrong. Yeah, the yeah, I, 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 I totally agree with you, and, and therefore I recommend the niche paper to you. Remember the paper I mentioned earlier? Um, because this is what... Uh, he agonizes with. And the, 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 the beauty of this paper is that he looks at it not just from the lens of English law, he looks at the position in Singapore where a more rational uh, jurisprudence uh, has emerged. He looked at the position in Germany, um, he looks at the position in Canada, he looks at the position in the, U in the US, right? And it is pretty clear that the area is in a mess. So I entirely agree with you, right? That ultimately, it's not about choosing one over the other. You can have the two. Because all, you know, they, surely if we penalize directors, then we deter, right? We deter conduct. Does anybody have any other questions? Okay, um, then we, we then have um, um, it, uh, internal control within corporate governance. Let me just say this and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll take, no, you know what, let's take a break at this point. We'll take a break. Uh, then we'll start, we'll start here. So tell me a break and then we'll continue. I always think that in the morning you don't need breaks, you're all like active. And, you know.
so a lot of people hear short seller and they think that you're your bad guy or you're doing something wrong. Carson Block of Money Waters, the investment firm, announced a big short short seller at Carson Block. We heard from the uh, NYSE president uh, this week. Sorry, um, trying to get the volume. OSI Systems has been around for a long time. Uh, its founder is still the CEO, Deepak Chopra. Not that Deepak Chopra. Post 9-11, um, one of the businesses they had acquired called Rapiscale has experienced a substantial amount of growth because it's the company that builds a lot of the scanners that we see in airports to scan checked luggage as well as hand luggage. Rapiscan is part of the security division. And security division was about 60% of total revenue, total revenue being 961 million. In terms of profit, though, the security division is far and away the driver of profits in the company. They have this business line where they're trying to sell these turnkey contracts, um, 3D scanning of cargo containers, or scanning devices, put the container on a truck, the truck drives either to or through the scanner, and then that way customs apparently sees a 3D image of everything that's inside the container, so they can see for smuggling or what have you. What a turnkey contract in this case is, a foreign government awards OSI a concession. And the concession consists of OSI providing the equipment and also providing the personnel and training the personnel to operate them. So it's not in the street like, yeah, look, we used to be a business that sold hardware. But now you've got to think of us as kind of like the SaaS type company because we have this like great recurring revenue. You know, we have all these new contracts we're signing and all these wonderful markets. How does somebody from the outside who's say corruption watchdog easily compare the pricing of that service contract to what it should be? There really aren't good comps there. So it does make it easier to pad that margin and peel money off to pay kickbacks as well as make a lot more money for the company. So OSI in 2009 acquired a company called S2. And S2 was started by Jonathan Flynn, who had been the chief operating officer of the TSA. So S2 is the division that does the turnkey contracts. When OSI bought S2, S2 was just a business plan and Jonathan Flynn. That's all. Okay. Yeah. 
has to be uncomfortable in high standards, which is only by people that he is a doctor. And it's been reported in the Albanian press that he's very close to the meeting in the Albanian leadership. This should have occurred for some real money. Yet, when they say it's 89% stake, the purchase consideration was Albanian lack of 490. 490 Albanian lek, which at the time worked out to about $4.50 US. And then you can No, $4. Exactly. There is no way that you can justify that sort of transaction under those circumstances. At least if you try to justify it and say that you did not break the law. Like all of this is public documentation that's on the internet, right? This is the website. Alright, so from these docs, this is how you'll see in what transfer took place, when it took place. So we would expect to see in the income statement a deduction for minority interests. Pre-tax, income tax, and minority income tax per share. So, right here, we can see minority interest on people with interest deduction, and then you see the income tax. It appears to us as though their books are not even reflecting that they only own about half of the S2 Albania subsidiary. Yeah, how does that trickle down on the business? And I think those are questions that somebody really needs to ask anyway. We then look at the Mexico contract. And the Mexico turnkey contract was actually entered into prior to Albania. But there are some things there that are particularly strange as well. So you're saying the Mexico turnkey contract is, we estimate, at least 50% of the security division of the or 50% of the company? Not 50% of the overall company. So number one, you have to ask, how could this contract in Mexico be so lucrative? How could it have such a high profit margin? So with Albania, we able to get all these documents online. There are multiple news reports. Mexico is entirely different. So you really have to do a lot of work in talking with people, and you have to piece together these little fragments of information from these conversations. We've engaged multiple investigators to speak with more people um, on the SAT, which is the tax bill that they're in, more than the contract, to get their understanding of what's really happened. So we have this one interview from more SAT officials, and this guy was very upfront. He also explained that this contract was deliberately oversold in the sense that they said, oh, you don't need humans anymore with my machines, you don't have to have these people there. And that is a lie. They're just average machines like any other on the market. The only thing that they're selling is this big bad contract and that is posting a service that has nothing to do with these extra machines and they're actually not giving. It's just a way to try to justify a high enough price as well as to create a better margin for OSI. He doesn't see how SAT would renew this contract. Puerto Rico was.
Okay, so um, so here, uh, if you remember, we 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 after defining the concept, we then tried to situate the ideas within company law. Now what we're doing is trying to situate the ideas within corporate governance, <laughs> right? And and uh, so uh, here I say that. Uh, as we all know, corporate governance focuses on broad diversity, broad structure, broad process, and values to tackle <coughs> uh, the, the problem. And um, we all know, we all know that uh, these ideas are crucial to risk management. In other words, if you have um, a broad structure that maybe has a committee on risk, right? So a board committee that that is dedicated to risk management, that generally that is better than uh, not having any such thing, right? So it doesn't mean that the board itself uh, uh, is not interested in risk. Remember, we talked about horizontal delegation. I said, even if the board, uh, delegates risk management horizontally to a committee of the board, to the risk management committee, the Barings case tells us that the board retains overall supervision, right? Okay? So, but my point is that the fact that you have a risk management committee, uh, wh which is really a feature of corporate governance, right? Because corporate governance is, is interested in structures, processes, that that surely must be a good thing. Right? So, board diverse, and, and also, if we have a board that is diverse, I always say to people, it's always good to have lawyers on your board. No, really, not, you know, it's always good. I mean, lawyers think about risk, right? Um, you know, uh, you know when, when, I, uh, when, I, when I talk to non-lawyers, um, it's interesting how they do not think about risk. And, uh, and risk is just kind of wired into how I think. So I think lawyers think about risk, and, and diverse boards uh, would be um, good. In fact, there's a line in the Nietzsche article, there's a line in the Nietzsche article uh, where he makes this point. He says, you know, it's one thing to say, okay, we have this committee, but, you know, how do you make these assessments? Lawyers are best trained, right, to make these assessments and all that. I'm not saying we should dominate the board with lawyers, but I'm just saying it's always good to have lawyers uh, on point. And if, again, if we go back to the J.P. Morgan case, I think any lawyer on the board of J.P. Morgan who looked at the amount of money involved would simply say that, well, why don't we get a legal opinion? Right? Because you know, you know why? The rule of law is wired into us. We understand the rule of law. We know that government is under the law. Many people don't understand this. Many people think government is the law. If the government says it's lawful, right? But, you know, it, it doesn't follow. The go you know, that's why we have judicial review. So lawyers will ask those questions. So that's the point here uh, that I make. And I, and I refer you to uh, uh, the, the, the empirical research that supports this. Uh, the Bagwat, Bagwat paper, uh, and, and also research that shows diversity leads to better firm performance, and these are all recent uh, empirical uh, 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 papers. So that's one aspect of corporate governance uh, as far as risk management is concerned. And then uh, do not forget uh, the role of risk-related activism, and that's why I played the Muddy Waters clip, right? So there you get risk-related activism. They would say they're promoting corporate governance. Right, okay, so the other point to then flag up is how corporate governance situates uh, risk management in the board. So here what I did was look into the FRC guidance document 
And together with that document and my understanding of the subject uh, and the case law, and you know, I try to weave this together to inform this current narrative. Um, and and so, so there are a number of points, and I also bring in papers, right, so that everything sort of gels together. So the very first point here is that uh, good stewardship by the board should not inhibit sensible risk taking that is critical to growth, right? So you, you should, you know, drive revenue, take risks and all that, right? Uh, the idea basically is not for you not to take risks. Uh, and, uh, and then they, they say the assessment of risk as part of normal business planning is key. In other words, the, the, the operative word is embedding. You've got to embed risk analysis into everything you do. So as you drive revenue, drive revenue with risk embedded into your thinking. And um, so uh, again, here I refer to this paper um, where <coughs> you, you see uh, Itner basically saying that we find the location of board risk oversight responsibilities to be a major determinant of board risk oversight practices with greater oversight in firms that formally assign responsibilities to the board as a whole as well as to its committees. So notice the point I made earlier about rebarrings. Rebarrings are saying you are in charge of risk, you can't get away from it. Yes, we allow a degree of delegation, there can be horizontal delegation to a risk management committee, which is good, right? Um, especially if you have a chief risk officer who can feed in to, you know, so you get reporting lines that feed into the risk management committee uh, that bypasses the CEO and straight to the board, the chairman, right? So that way, no one person can block you, right? And, and so that's what that paper is saying. And then notice here, it says, risk management cannot eliminate all risk. Risk management cannot eliminate all risk. There was a paper published in 1921 by Knight. His name is Knight, where he talked about, so now we talk about Knight and, Knight and uncertainty. And he makes a distinction between uncertainty and risk. And he says, you know, risk you can quantify, uncertainty you can't, right? So you can't really guard against. But the point is that, the point is that you should have processes in place. It is the role of the boards to ensure that they are robust and effective and take account of such risks. So you have to have a robust assessment of the principal risks. Right? You notice that the term principal risk keeps on coming in, up again and again. Right? It used to be called significant, but they shifted. But I don't think there's any change. They, they meant any real change in the meaning. Right? But the idea basically is that the board should constantly think about risk and should constantly think about the principal risks that the company faces. And when we think about principal risk, it really isn't just about solvency. It, it, it isn't just about whether the company will be a great concern, right? It goes way beyond solvency to everything. So again, it should not be treated as a, as a separate compliance issue. If we embed it into the, en the enterprise, then it's not gonna be regarded as a separate compliance issue. It's gonna be something the entire board is interested in. In other words, here we're talking about the organizational culture, right? We're talking about the culture of the firm. This is a matter of organizational culture. So here we're looking at the, the people operating the system, what their incentives are. So that, I mean, I, now you can see the link with remuneration. Because if you, if you have the wrong remuneration system, right, then it could make it worse. And, I, and I, interestingly, and this is what the OECD paper was alluding to, uh, when Jensen and Merklin wrote their paper on agency cost, they said, one way we can align the interest of owners and managers is to get managers to be bonded to the firm. And how do we do this? Let's move away from cash-based payments 
to stock options, right? And and but but you know the, the theory being that you know everybody then sort of you know uh, would see things the same way. But the problem was that when it became excessive, that then became the real problem and, and became the source of more risk because uh, you know the, the managers of a firm will do anything to inflate artificially or in the short term the share price of the company so that they could cash out. And you see, a lot of people have talked about this, even Bevchuk, uh, you know, uh, alluded to this uh, in, 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 in a paper he, uh, I'll, I'll be mentioning. So, um, it, it <clears throat> so we need to basically uh, incentivize desired behaviors as well as sanction uh, inappropriate behavior, right? Uh, so the reward systems ultimately support uh, the risk management systems in place. So again, I, I pick up on remuneration here and the strong influence it has on, um, sorry, the, the strong influence it has on, uh, on risk taking. And I refer you to Jensen's paper. So I said to be sure, it is important to bear in mind that increased risk that should be taken, T-A-K-I-N-G. Increased risk taken was specifically seen as a good outcome of compensation systems that were stock-based <coughs> and bonus-based. The idea was that if we pay them in shares, then managers will take more risks, but the right kind of risk to grow the firm. You know, you know taking too little risk is not good. Then you're like a civil servant. You might as well be in the public sector. Right? So taking too little risk is not good. So the idea was that if we pay them in, 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 in stocks, they will take more risks. But the problem, like many things in life, is too much. If you, take, if you, if you do too much of it, then it, it becomes a problem. Uh, so, so one solution was to establish incentive com compensation systems for managers to give them stock options. And I say here, like many things in life, the problem is, is when it becomes excessive. Because when it becomes excessive, then it means that the, the managers basically uh, socialize the risk and capture the upside, right? So they socialize the consequences of risk to the shareholders and capture the upside. And, uh, and, and that we have seen. And, 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 and look at this comment by uh, Bevchen, where he says that from 2000 to 2008, the top five executives, five people, just five people, and right, 1.4 billion and 1 billion respectively in eight years, right? And, and this is in, 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 in Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. So just five people and 1.8 in one year. Um, now, um, here I talk about um, uh, lines of communication and information flow. Um, so, so here we're looking at reporting lines. So even if you have a risk management committee looking into risk and the board's not abdicating its role, uh, maybe we should also have a risk management officer or a compliance officer, but who does he report to? If he reports to the CEO, then that's not working, right? So you need to find a way for him to report either directly to the board or to the risk management committee of the board, right? Uh, and uh, so here you see uh, the FRC guidance saying that the board needs to go a stage further to ensure that there is adequate discussion of the matter at board level. Uh, the board should agree the frequency and scope of the discussions and its assessment of how the assessment of risk is integrated with other matters. It is often the case that the board will have to delegate, but remember my point about delegation. You can't absolve yourself of responsibility. And that's why here I say case law tells us that the board retains ultimate responsibility for the risk management and internal control systems. And that comes from the Barings Bank case.
Then we get to the rules on corporate governance. So when we get to the code on corporate governance, right? So notice what we've been doing. We've just been building gradually, right? We've situated within corporate governance. So now let's look at the code on corporate governance. What does it say about risk assessment, uh, risk management? It, 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 it says those three things in those principles, M, N, and O. The board should establish formal and transparent policies and procedures to ensure that the to ensure the independence and effectiveness of internal and external audit functions. Uh, we'll talk about this when we talk about financial statements. Then it says uh, uh, to present a fair, balanced, understandable assessment of the company's position. We'll talk about that later. And then in O, that's really what we're dealing with, the board should establish procedures to manage risk. Right? Company law does not tell us about procedures to manage risk. Company law just tells us that if you fail, then there may be liability under Section 174. So this is a fine example of corporate governance as the app, right? Company law as the, as the, the, the hardware and corporate governance as the app coming in to say, well, you should establish procedures to manage risk. And remember, you have to explain or comply, right? So you comply with this. And if you don't comply with it, then you explain why. And this forces people to comply. To oversee the internal control framework and determine the nature and extent of the principal risk the company is willing to take in order to achieve its long-term strategic objectives. Remember I talked about principal risks. So that's all the code on corporate governance says. That. Um, but then when we look at the guidance document on risk management, uh, uh, you, you see it fleshing out the board's responsibilities for risk management and internal control. So what this means, if you have a problem question, and the question says, you know, tells you about the uh, board and then says, you know, advise us on the corporate governance issues, right? Then you want to look into what have they done. Now, there may be a question as to, there may be a question you may be thinking of, which is, to what extent can these statements infuse the relevant company law standard, right? Say, so if a George is looking at whether or not you have complied with Section 174, or rather whether you breach Section 174, can the judge look at whether you have set up these procedures that the Code on Corporate Governance and the guidelines have told us to do? Now, it seems to me that if the, the closer you are to complying with this, the better you are, right? The better position you would be for purposes of liability. So, uh, the board's responsibilities are ensuring the design and implementation of appropriate risk management and internal control systems to identify risks the company faces, right? And remember, the principal risks. Determining the nature and extent of the company's principal risks, i.e., what's your risk appetite? What kind of things can you do? Um, you know, what, what's your risk appetite? So, so, so think about muddy waters. You know, Muddy Waters is attacked because of its contract in Albania, in Mexico, and, uh, and you see them saying kind of disparaging things about this. And, you know, so I, I suppose the board of Muddy Waters would have to decide what's our risk appetite. Do we go into some countries or not? Right? Do we go into some countries or not? Because the risk may be too much. Right? And if you choose, and if you say that, well, you know, the world is a big place, I don't need to go to a particular country. That may simply be you saying that's the level of my risk appetite. That's a matter for the board, right? Um, and um, so then, then also ensuring their proper culture and reward systems have been embedded through the organization. That's what we've been talking about, looking at your remuneration systems so that your remuneration systems are properly aligned. Agreeing how the principal risk should be managed or mitigated to reduce their incidence or impact, uh, monitoring and reviewing the risk management and internal control systems, and sure, basically satisfying yourself that these systems are working. Remember, in Citigroup, 
in the Citigroup case, applying the Care Act standard, they said liability for failure to monitor, which would be granted under Section 174, right? Liability will follow. If A, you don't have a system, and B, even if you have a system, you willfully fail to monitor. You see? So the Americans talk about the duty to monitor. We talk about it as Section 174, right? But it comes down, down to the same thing. And I'm saying now that if you have a system or you fail to set up a system, then it may just be more difficult for you to uh, disclaim any kind of liability under Section 174. And what does this mean? What does this mean? It means that because we're talking under 174, we're talking about the liability of the directors, isn't it? So we're, by definition, the company is suing the directors. But in a lot of cases where some wrong has occurred, it's a third party outside who has suffered. So the third party is suing the company, right? So there are two kinds of actions. Either the third party, right, maybe a contracting party, a tort uh, victim is suing the company. There the liability is the company, right? Or a regulator is suing the company. There the liability is the company. Then after you finish with the liability of the company, then we can then say, let us decide whether to penalize the directors. Right? So there we'll be asking, have the directors complied with their duties? Right? Section 174. You see? Okay. And um, ensuring sound internal and external information and communication processes and taking responsibility for external communication risk management and internal control. So here I say, consider a scenario where you have to advise a board on the establishment of procedures to manage risk. So these are some of the questions I came up with. First, the board should carry out a robust assessment of the company's emerging and principal risks. What are the principal risks of the company? So think about the, the question, any kind of scenario, you know, think about it that way. What are the principal risks of the company? Obviously, this would, de this would depend on the company's business, the market, and all that. What procedures are in place to identify these risks? Uh, how does the board assess the prospects of the company and over what period? How are the risks being managed or mitigated? So that's a, con a constant one, right? So because that, that forces you to check whether your systems are, are working. So think about cybersecurity. There's no point just setting up a system. You, you need to have a process for checking it up, right? Uh, 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 have there been close calls or near misses? In light of the fact that the board can, uh, sorry, in light of the fact that risk can uh, uh, crystallize rapidly, uh, what systems are in place to elevate such concerns? Uh, how is the board's monitoring of the company's uh, uh, management uh, system? Sorry, has the board carried out? You know, I do wish the page So that, that's the board, not boats. Correct that, please. <laughs> If you see anything crazy from me, it's not me. It's Dragon, right? Okay. Um, uh, so anyway, so does this review cover all material controls such as financial, operational, and compliance, right? So the full, the full thing. Um, and, and here I say a lot will depend on the type of company, right? It will depend on the size and composition of the company. And, and here, I refer you to the Wolf Report, right? Um, you see, Wolf, Lord Wolf, uh, did a report on BAE. BAE is a defense company. They make, they make, they make bombs. They, they, they make things that kill people, lots of people. And um, so there was a contract to sell arms to Saudi Arabia. And there was some corruption. And uh, at one stage, the government, you know, the, the Saudis put pressure on the government to shut down the corruption uh, investigation. And, uh, and, and 